Hello. Oh, mic's on. Excellent. Uh, welcome. I think we are the last session for y'all today before the food and festivities at the booth crawl. So we'll try to keep this short and concise. Uh, I'm here to talk about containers workflows at scale with build packs. Um, and when I talk about scale, I mean companies like Heroku, Salesforce, Bloomberg, uh, who Google, who need to build billions of container images. I'm Terrence Lee. Uh, I'm an architect at Heroku. I'm also one of the founders of the Cloud Native Build Packs project. Yeah, I'm Jesse Brown. I'm also an architect at Heroku, and I'm a maintainer on the Build Packs project. Um, so here's the agenda of what we're going to talk about. We're going to give a brief overview of what Build Packs are. If you don't know what Build Packs, um, uh, talk about how um, we can build things efficiently. Um, go into kind of some day two operation things with how it impacts the software supply chain, and then. Uh, kind of cover the build pack ecosystem of how you can actually use this uh, in your company. So starting from the top, what are build packs? Uh, for those of you who aren't as familiar, build packs basically take your application source code and transforms your application into an OCI image uh, without the use of Docker files. And what you get at the other end is a um, OCI image that maps logically to your application. Um, and so this allows you to you know, use it like any other Docker image uh, that you have or OCI image, you can push it up to a registry, uh, you can, you know, inherit from it with a from in another Docker, in an actual Docker file um, and use it. It's just an OCI image. Uh, and here's an example of us building a generic Ruby application uh, using the Heroku Builder, uh, using the PAC CLI that's part of the project. So what, it, what you're seeing here is it actually automatically detects uh, that it's a Ruby application goes and installs the Ruby runtime for you and installs all the dependencies that are part of the application itself. And then you get um, all the layers exported into an image. And so this is us looking to that image uh, with a tool called Dive. Um, and you can kind of see uh, the layers that are mapped here. And what you get is you get uh, kind of an optimized image with the minimal amount of kind of layers and things that are part of it, uh, as well as metadata and things associated uh, with that image itself. And so, you know, we've been kind of showing off things with PAC, uh, kind of from an application developer perspective, right? Like I have an application, I need to containerize it, um, and I didn't need to use the Docker file. And the way, and, and so the benefit of that is like, I didn't have to artisanally copy and paste things into a Docker file to get everything I needed um, to get that working container image. And the way I'm able to do that is because there are a set of build pack authors that actually go ahead and, and build and create these build packs. And what they do is they create these build packs that basically encapsulate a certain technology. And when I talk about um, technologies, I mean stuff like Ruby, Java, PHP, things like that. And so those build packs can go through and do all those things that are needed. And they're composable and shareable, and we'll kind of go into that later in the talk. And, and then on the other side is, because we're able to do that, it allows the platform team to basically minimize the amount of things they need to do, right? So um, at Heroku, we are able to maintain a single base image for any specific kind of Linux distribution version. Uh, in our case, we maintain um, stuff based off of canonical Ubuntu LTS releases, and we don't have one for uh, Ubuntu 2404 Java, Ubuntu 2404 uh, JavaScript. We have a single Ubuntu 2404 image, and those build packs are able to basically inject the application-specific layers into them, and so that allows uh, us to have this kind of organizational efficiency of that platform team is able to maintain a like, significantly less number of base images that I've seen compared to a lot of other organizations. And so... As we talk about build efficiencies, uh, we actually should talk about how we're able to do that. Yeah, this is a talk about scaling. So we want to talk about how to scale builds themselves efficiently and what build packs is doing. Um, you know, we've all been there making Docker file changes or application changes, and then all your cache is busted from what seems like a simple change. And if you haven't done the Docker file gymnastics, then you know you have to kind of go back and figure out how to bust that cache or how to make that cache more resilient to what are daily changes in your application. Um, many applications are coupled to the operating system due to the way Docker files are sort of laid out. And as a result, those images frequently need to be rebuilt to apply OS level patches. 
And they also have to be updated to patch CVEs that are on things that the application itself doesn't even rely on. The cloud native ecosystem has brought great productivity and operational improvements to software development, but we've lost sight of how wasteful some of those technologies are. Build packs have been designed to work at the scale that we're talking about without where, where waste has a real cost. On this slide, we're going up, we're rebuilding the same application that we built earlier. And what you'll notice is at the end of this, all the layers are reused. Build packs is a, um, you know, one of our big focuses is reproducibility. So every time you send in the same source code and the same build packs, you're gonna get the same image out on the other side. That allows for very efficient reuse of the layers so that you're not wasting time, compute time doing the same thing over and over. And let's see. Yeah, and it, these layers are also build pack specific. So if you're not making changes to your NPM packages, then those layers get reused. And if you do make NPM changes, then that's the only layer that's gonna get uh, regenerated the next time you build. In this continuation of the example, we're adding like an entirely new language, in this case, like a Go application to our, Ro to our Ruby and Node application. As you might expect, the build process um, now includes downloading Go tools to produce the image, um, as you would expect, but it doesn't bust the cache for Ruby. It doesn't bust the cache for Node, and those are pr preserved from the previous build. Um, the, cache, the caches themselves for things that don't end up in your final image are also dictated by the build pack. So if you've got Go tooling that needs to happen during build time but don't end up in your run image, the build pack is in charge of that cache layer and can be very specific about when and how that cache layer is invalidated. And yeah, so that's a lot of the control for the build pack authors who write the, you know, language specific build packs or tool specific build packs to be able to, you know, make sure that we're not wasting cycles doing the same thing over and over again. Now let's go back to like an OS update. Um, you know, CVEs happen and packages need to be updated on the base OS. Um, because of the layered approach that build packs takes, we're able to basically take these application and build pack specific layers and transplant them onto a new base image. And this is possible because of like ABI compatibility between your release. So if your base images keep compatibility between updates, then we can basically take those exact same layers, digest and all, and put them on top of a, uh, a new image. And this is all just an, a um, registry operation. So there's no build. You don't need the source code. You don't need the package managers. You can just do this at scale. So when you're talking about scale, where organizations have hundreds to thousands of images, being able to patch a CVE without having to rebuild the entirety of all of your, those Docker images is you know, you know, substantially more efficient. Um, yeah, so with a traditional Docker file, patching a CVE across a fleet of this many images would require you to have the source code, require you to um, have the uh, package managers be online. You know, if there was a package manager that was the cause of the CVE, then it might not be online. You can't produce images that haven't been built. And, in months or potentially years. Um, so rebase really allows you to, you know, improve the ability for you to patch at scale. Cool. So continuing on kind of day two operations, Jesse covered some stuff like uh, image updating that is pretty common. Um, uh, so I don't know how many of you all are familiar with the software supply chain. Um, but, you know, like how I think about it is basically as a software developer, I have some source code. Uh, I want to build it and make sure that the thing that I actually built ends up in production. And that's what my customers are using, right? Including all the dependencies and things. Um, and so all those components kind of in that chain. And as we kind of break down the different uh, threats, there's, you know, on one end you have like kind of source threats. Uh, but I think the main part since uh, build packs are focused uh, in kind of the CNCF landscape on on constructing container images, uh, I'm gonna focus mostly on kind of build and dependency threats here, because that's uh, the wheelhouse that uh, uh, we'll be working in. So uh, there was a security, uh, a large security thing uh, for folks who were following back in, I wanna say like 2020, where a bunch of computers were impacted and uh, 
companies like uh, Microsoft, Intel, others were affected by this, as well as certain government agencies uh, as well. And uh, as a result of that, um, the White House passed uh, Executive Order 1428, uh, which was about leveling up the cybersecurity of uh, the government, as well as kind of many government agencies uh, working with the government itself. Um, and some of those things that came out of that are, uh, you know, some obvious things like requiring multi-factor authentication um, and things like that that uh, kind of fall in kind of like the source threats, like ensuring that your laptop or computer is secure and you are the actual person like doing those um, code changes, um, all the way to like certain things like software bill materials uh, to kind of ensure you know what you're actually running in production. And it wasn't specific to just uh, the U.S. Uh, kind of across the pond. Uh, the US, U, EU Cyber Resilience Act uh, also got passed and, you know, trying to basically protect uh, businesses and consumers. And, you know, kind of as a fun fact, I think they estimated that they thought cyber crime would be about, estimated to be about like 5.5 trillion euros uh, by 2021. And this wasn't obviously a unique incident. Uh, I think a lot of folks have been dealing with software supply chain things. Uh, it's steadily been on the rise on that good like startup hockey stick growth uh, that you all want to see in a business, but probably not for cybersecurity things. And so it's a thing that uh, a lot of us have kind of been thinking about and kind of taking into account um, as well. So where do build packs fit in? Um, so you know, I, this was the slide that we had kind of at the beginning talking about build packs. And so one of the things that build packs provide you with uh, standardization is that um, it decreases the amount of snowflakes that exist in your organization. And so that organizational efficiency basically allows us to standardize certain things like how your Java application is built across your entire organization, right? Like you don't have a unique way to build your app, your Java app for every single repo inside of your organization. There is like one way you do it across your organization and it supports that level of diversity, right? So that means that if you ever have to make changes for uh, debugging purposes or uh, compliance or any of those things, there's a single way to do that. And that also allows you to then build standardized infrastructure um, for dealing kind of with your software supply chain uh, to ensure that you're building it the same exact way all across your organization. Uh, in addition to that, um, as part of the build pack specification, build pack authors are able to provide a software build materials. Um, for those of you who aren't as familiar with it, um, the software build materials um, has basically two popular formats. There's Cyclone DX and SPDX. And generally it provides uh, insight into like what you're actually running in production. And so that'll include all the kind of dependencies, components, uh, versions, licensing uh, that you get with that. Um, and uh, the best time to actually do this is, you know, you might ask like, well, can't I just do this after my image is built? And there's a ton of tools that allow you to just like scan your uh, OCI or Docker image and then kind of get a SBOM at the end. And I think it's been generally considered best practice that the best time to do this is actually at build time. And the reason that is is because, yes, that tooling can generate those things um, for the stuff in that launch image or the release image. But what you miss out on are all the things that kind of Jesse was talking about of like the things that don't get included in the image, right? Because they're also an important part of the build provenance of like how that image was produced, right? So all the build tools, like the Go tool chain that you use that you will likely remove from that image because you don't need that at runtime, right? Um, and so uh, all those things can be produced. You can have separate build and production uh, S-bombs that you can then uh, ingest in whatever kind of ingestion system you have to do dependency management, OPA license policy things uh, on these images that you're producing. And so uh, here's an example. Um, so we're using the Paquetto build packs, uh, so kind of different build pack group to produce these. So producing a build, and this is, shows how you, it, quick and simple it is uh, using the Pax UI to go and download the SBOM that's produced as part of that build. So uh, the, each layer is able to produce an SBOM. So if you have like your Java runtime layer, right? Like you'll have an SBOM for that. And then uh, the Maven will have all of your kind of Maven dependencies, et cetera. And then if you're introducing multiple different languages, you can get layers for all that. Um, and then you can combine that with 
your base image S bombs that you're producing as part of that to kind of get a complete picture of like what you're actually running. Um, so now on to kind of the build pack ecosystem and talking about how do I actually go ahead and uh, use these build packs and, and incorporate them into my organization. Um, so in this talk, uh, at the beginning, we had a pack build building that Ruby application. That was done with uh, the Heroku build packs. And so at Heroku, we have a languages team that basically supports a bunch of various languages. And their job is to maintain uh, kind of build packs in six supported ecosystems. And so instead of having to go and build your own build pack, uh, you can go use those ones. But um, they're not the only one. Uh, there's also the Paquetto build packs, which is also another open source project. Um, and uh, uh, those are also a very popular set of build packs. And then uh, Google also provides a set of public build packs for their Google Cloud Run uh, platform. So kind of the takeaway for me is that um, similar to Docker, you have the Docker library. You don't have to go and build like your base image from scratch, right? Like mo most people are going to inherit from an existing library or Docker image to get started. And similarly, I think a lot of people getting started with build packs, like you shouldn't have to go and figure out how do I build Java, right? Like get started, uh, use someone else's, like these companies that are basically staffing and having open source projects built around how they standardize how these applications are built and then kind of build on top of that, right? And so uh, linked are the GitHub repos as well as kind of the builder images that you're gonna use when you pass in the pack build um, to kind of get um, started there. Um, in addition to uh, build pack themselves, uh, there's also a bunch of platforms. So we've been showing off a lot of stuff with pack. Pack is the local CLI that's part of uh, the build pack project. It's probably the way most people get started, the easiest way to get started with build packs. Um, you know, it's on Homebrew. Uh, we have it in a bunch of Linux distro formats as well, Arch, Ubuntu, et cetera. Uh, and uh, for a lot of people, that's like, they do it locally, but then they also use it in uh, CI, CD, right? So they stick in their Jenkins system, they run pack. Uh, now they have, uh, you know, production grade uh, images coming out of their CI, CD system without having to like do anything custom. Uh, uh, the build pack project itself, actually maintains a set of GitHub actions, so you can get pack as part of that without having to kind of go and figure out how to do that. Um, we also provide a circle CI orb, uh, and we use that GitHub action both in the CMB project for our own testing purposes to test um, the project itself, and then kind of on the Heroku build packs project, we use it to test our build packs there as well. Um, as part of the project, we also have a Tecton template uh, if you want to get started um, if you're using Tecton that way, and then also, uh, Spring Boot, uh, the Java web framework, um, actually has cloud native build packs built in uh, that leverage uh, the Paquetto build packs that we mentioned before. And you can actually get started uh, without Docker, um, just running Maven and get a containerized Java uh, image like from the go, uh, super simple. Uh, but of course, we're at KubeCon, so uh, we should talk about how you can do this with Kubernetes. Right, yeah, so last year, KPAC was donated to the Build Packs project. Um, you may have heard about it before, but if you didn't, KPAC is a Kubernetes operator that allows you to declaratively decline your resulting images that you want. Like most things in Kubernetes, there's a CRD. So that's what that looks like over there, right? So the main important things here, you're having your source code defined, where you're gonna pull your source code, what builder you wanna use, whether that's a public builder like we talked about or declared in your cluster with your own custom Build Packs and your own custom run images. And then obviously, kind of the resulting repository of where you want those images to be produced. And um, yeah, so this is kind of what that looks like. You apply a CRD to your Kubernetes cluster and you can pull down the, the build status and the logs and the, you know all that stuff that you would expect from a typical sort of automated build system. Um, but like most things, Kubernetes, because it's an operator, it doesn't just build it once, right? It's gonna produce this image continuously. So that's one of the big features of KPAC is anytime any of these sources change, it's gonna reproduce that image for you in the most efficient way that it can. So if your source code changes, it's going to produce a build, tag it the way that you would expect, and hopefully do as little work as possible to build that resulting image. Anytime a OS update happens, it's gonna do a rebase if possible and a rebuild if not. And so it's gonna continually keep your defined images up to date so you can have a 
you know, a whole bunch of these image CRDs in your cluster, and KPAC's going to try to keep all those things up to date so that your deployments can, you know, be on patched OSs and have the latest and greatest of, uh, you know, the languages and the ecosystems that you're adopted into. And, um, yeah, so KPAC is SALSA 3 compliant standard, or, yeah, meets SALSA 3 compliant standard guidelines. We've already kind of talked about how, you know, the declarative image allows you to have like a consistent declaration for what happens in a build. And we talked about build reproducibility being a key tenant for build packs. Uh, KPAC can also produce attestations for the resulting image. And those, are, those would be written to the same registry using the same tag discovery stuff that you would use in like Cosign or similar tooling. And uh, yeah, that's, that's KPAC, so definitely check that out. And uh, come see us at the booth about that too. Yeah, so kind of in closing, hopefully uh, you're coming to some of these conclusions. Uh, I, I think one of the big things with Bill Pax is, you know, I, I, we've seen this shift, uh, I think, over the last probably half a decade about shifting a bunch of stuff left, putting a lot of things kind of on application developers. Uh, I feel like uh, I like to coin this phrase like the fuller stack developer, um, where, you know, full stack developers were, you know, worried about front end, back end, probably the product they're working on. and. I think in the modern platform world, they have to think about a lot more things, right? Like, how do I containerize my application? Um, things like that for build. And um, I think build packs can help your organization um, with reducing kind of the cognitive load that you're going to have to deal with um, from the day-to-day -day application. Um, but not just for application developers. I think uh, build packs also provide a way to think about how you can separate some of these roles and responsibilities as well. So both the platform team, uh, figuring out like where that seam should be, right? Um, and kind of where uh, the seams should be for your application developer. Um, we walked through some of the things with PAC and some of the demos that Jesse talked about uh, around build efficiencies um, and how uh, you're actually like reducing the amount of work that you're doing. Um, and that simply helps with um, scaling uh, your application for kind of those day one um, operations, um, but also in addition to the day two stuff, right? Like, I think things like rebase, right? Uh, uh, we talked about, we showed like, you know, like those images where we're able to do this lift and shift. Um, and it's important to note, like those digests aren't changing for those application layers. So some of those things we're able to do is, you know, if you're redeploying this thing to that existing, that node where you're re updating that image, like you actually just only have to push a JSON manifest for that OCI image and that base image, right? And all those application layers are already there um, because we're actually rewriting a new image but not changing those application layers. And we're also, more importantly, not doing a rebuild. And so those kind of things really help out on scale um, as well as any of the software supply chain things down the line. Um, that's kind of it of what we had for a talk. Uh, um, on Friday, uh, Joe Kuttner, who is also a maintainer of the project, is doing a whole talk on platform engineer engineering that uh, will kind of touch on some of the stuff for kind of building internal platforms as well. Um, uh, we are also in the Project Pavilion in the afternoons, um, so we'll be at the booth crawl right after this talk. Uh, if you have questions, you want to come talk to us privately. And we're, of course, also online. So if you head over to github.com slash buildpacks, uh, that's the org where all of our stuff is open source. Um, and uh, we're on the CNCF Slack in the Build Packs room. Um, and come talk to us. And yeah, that's all we had. Thanks. I know we have about, I think, like 10 ish minutes for questions. So if people have questions, uh, there's mics on the hallways, happy to, or the kind of lanes, happy to answer any of the questions while we're up here. One just thing on. Okay, I think this is on. Okay, there we go. Um, you talked about that there Google has build packs and Herik are the I know the end result is obviously a container, but is the syntax for each of their build packs the same and they're just managing different sets of build packs or is there a different kind of syntax on yeah, on those? It all goes to the same build pack specification and the same process to build them. 
And so if you're a BuildPacks platform, we have spec specifications online, you know, that they match to kind of produce BuildPack images. And so in this case, you can use the same pack tool to build with any of these builders. And it mostly comes down to how they want their resulting images to look, right? So like, you know, if you're a Java developer uh, running them on Heroku, it may produce a slightly different result than, you know, the folks at Google who want to produce Java in a certain way, right? So it's mostly just going to come down to your style and how you want your uh, resulting images to look and what features they might or might not have. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Scott? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, this looks very nice for um, applications, images, uh, but what about images that has, um, an image that has a more generic purpose, like for instance, an image you use in a build node, uh, something more generic like a workload automation? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so you're talking about like, I have an image, but it's not like an application developer image for exactly. running my thing. Yeah. But like, may I want to create like a base image for doing that? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's, uh, I, I don't think, we don't have like a great answer for that um, today for some of that. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it's a, like we use Docker files, I think, like to do our base images. We aren't using build packs for that. And part of the reason why is, um, you know, when we're talking about uh, some of the rebase and other things, the reason we're able to, uh, do things like rebase is that we basically restrict where uh, the build packs are able to write to, right? So you can't write to anywhere on the file system. You have to write into kind of the application workspace directory or kind of this layer specific directory. And we know those places basically aren't where the underlying operating system is. Because um, if you're going to do conflicting stuff, then you actually can't do like any of the lift and shift rebase <clears throat> things. But it's a thing that um, we're thinking about, but we just haven't kind of figured out how to piece that stuff together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, anything else you want to add? Yeah, and like the uh, the talk that we mentioned that's on Friday, you know, I know that that team uses build packs to produce like Terraform and things like that, right? So like mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be an application image. It is sort of a generic build thing, but you do have to kind of stay in the lane of like, you know, if you're trying to produce the next like OS layer, it's probably not the right tool for that. But if you're going to like, you know, produce anything that you can use somewhere else that doesn't, that could be, could benefit from either rebasing or just being nice componentized building blocks, then, mm -hmm. then yeah. It, yeah, it can that, work. that's what I thought. It's, it's very ergonomic to specific um, source code natures, right? Mm -hmm. And I have a like, very, very, very quick question, last one. Um, is this the same build packs that Pivotal uses in Cloud Foundry? Uh, we don't work at Cloud Foundry, but um, they're basically the kind of genesis of the project came about because mm -hmm. uh, there was build packs at Heroku um, from kind of like 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Pivotal also basically created their own build packs that are actually forked from Heroku ones, but then rewrote them in Go later on. And oh, they so had kind of a separate ecosystem. And part of the build packs project actually was uh, Heroku and Pivotal coming together to create uh, the Cloud Native Build Packs project. So oh, I see. It, it's not uh, these, like those those Build Packs basically built stuff in a proprietary way. Like on Heroku, it was like slugs, and I think on uh, Cloud Foundry, they were like droplets, right? And so part of this project was both unifying the ecosystems um, because the APIs actually weren't compatible between the, the two ecosystems, as well as wanting to, you know, do open standards, OCI, like to leverage basically all the existing container tooling that uh, was out there and not create our own kind of ecosystem. Yeah, that, that answers my question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, how do you determine uh, base layer compatibility to decide if it's possible to perform uh, a rebase? Yeah, so for Heroku, you know, we, we only stay on like the LTS versions of the upstream Im images that we're, that we're using and they have a strict like ABI compatibility story between the versions. And so that's sort of what we rely on. So it's going to be up to, I guess, the the base image of like your vendor choice, or if you're going to make your own build packs and your own base images, then it's up to, you know, your own compatibility story there, right? Yeah, so it's um, yeah. Same major version, basically. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like it, e even for that, like you probably don't want to go from like Ubuntu 2204 to 2404, RHEL 8 to right. RHEL 9, right? Um, and so it kind of is to some degree determined by the 
platform, but yeah, that ABI compatibility for the base image is really the thing that makes it safe. 